Cogliandro Beyens and you are listening to the special Encard podcast series registered at the occasion of the 2022 edition of the Encard Academy. The goal of this podcast series is to learn how to become a change maker for a sustainable future. In this podcast series, you will listen to European leaders working in the broad field of culture. They will present you their work, their experience, their solutions to the current challenges and how they have used their digital managerial and green skills in an innovative way and thus to ensure a greener future. In this podcast, I have the pleasure to welcome Professor Andrew Holden from Goldschmidt University of London. My name is Andrew Holden. I'm a professor of environment and tourism at Goldsmiths University of London. My background is one that relates to aspects of sustainability and how that is applied to tourism um, in the environmental and cultural spheres. And what I want to talk to you about today particularly relates to aspects of sustainable cultural tourism. I'm going to talk about sustainable cultural tourism. This is an interesting topic for many destinations and places around the world about how tourism and culture intertwine. What I would like to begin with is just try to contextualize culture within sustainable tourism, i.e. how does tourism actually interact with types of culture and why is that relevant to looking at the issue of sustainability. So if I begin, we all know that culture is a contentious term. It's got many different interpretations. But in my view, I can recognize three main elements of where tourism interacts with culture. The first relates to tangible culture. So aspects of ancient monuments, buildings, artworks, the things that we, we recognize very often as iconic sites of culture and tourism. So places like the Vatican, places like the Taj Mahal in India, Angkor Wat in Cambodia. These are places that tourists um, visit um, because of the tangible heritage that is present um, there. There's also the aspects of intangible heritage. So looking at aspects of culture that relate to dance and ritual and storytelling. And these have become very, very popular for tourists um, to visit and experience. And the sociologist John Erie talked about the idea of gazing upon these spectacles that are part of many tourists' itineraries and um, are something that tourists like to experience. So we have the tangible and we have the intangible. And then the last category relates to living culture. Tourists actually visiting places and experiencing the lives of everyday people in those cities and places, like bars and restaurants and moving around, so the mobility aspect of the space that they're in and experiencing that with local people. So we can see a range of interactions across different cultural frontiers where tourists interact across the tangible, the intangible, and the living the living cultures. Now, all of those present opportunities for tourism and sustainability, and they present threats to tourism and sustainability. And the idea of sustainability and tourism culture is all very interlinked, as I will explain in this talk. So moving on, 
to how do these experiential interactions relate to sustainability? Well, firstly, if we look at sustainability and what it is, I like to go back to the idea of sustainable development and to the Brentland Report, Our Common Future, that was published in 1987. I see this as the, the seminal pillar, the cornerstone of what sustainability is actually about. And that report was set up from the Commission of the World Commission on Environment and Development. It was established by the United Nations, and it was led by Gro Hall and Brentland, who was the Prime Minister of Norway at that time. And she produced this report um, in, in 1987. And since then, we can recognise pillars of sustainability, which relate to economy, they relate to the natural environment, and they relate to culture and society. And the idea was to, as I'm sure you were, was to look at how we could progress development into the future without destroying the resource base um, that we have on the planet, um, both environment and cultural resources. So when we come back to tourism interacting with these three different aspects of culture, one of the opportunities that arises from that is to facilitate economic opportunity and livelihood opportunities. And this is very, very important for many, most well, most places around the world that experience, experience tourism. And it is about opportunities to enhance livelihoods and improve the welfare of individuals and, and society, to meet specific sustainable development goals, things like the empowerment of women and economic opportunities for women that can be created through tourism. For example, one of the most cited ones relates to handicraft production through bringing women into the tourism economy um, through that. So the facilitation of economic opportunity through cultural tourism is obviously very important to policy. Um, It's very important to local communities and it's very important at a more macro level as well, very often to uh, nations in terms of earning foreign exchange earnings, um, et cetera. Critically as well, tourism can provide revenues for the conservation of monuments and sites. Um, In an era where public sector expenditure has been decreased globally, then the importance of tourism is that it can, through permits and revenues, um, actually provide resources for the management of Um, sites, uh, tangible heritage sites, specifically uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites as a key example. And it is very important both for the strategic uh, development and everyday planning and management of those sites to provide the resources from tourism. And similarly, if we just have a look at natural heritage, you know, the idea of protecting national parks and um, special areas um, of of nature, again, very often require funding through tourism. So it's part of our heritage, our culture, both of built environments, everyday environments and nature. Tourism has a very, very important role to play in providing revenues um, for that. It also offers opportunities to educate people about other cultures. Um, One of the great possibilities, and it certainly works to a certain extent, of the great mobility that we have of people now. We have a higher level of mobility and access to it than any time in human history. And that presents opportunities to travel to other cultures, interact with people, and, of course, learn and benefit from that interchange of knowledge and experience. Just as people did on the silk routes in China thousands of years ago when traders covered different areas, different regions, and they went to different towns and they interacted with different people from different backgrounds, religions, and there was a great exchange of ideas around that. And tourism potentially offers that as well. So 
again, the opportunity to educate people is, is really important. And the last point I would say is that it can also increase awareness of local people about the, the universal value of their heritage and environment, about how special it is. I worked for quite a while on um, conservation sustainable development schemes in Annapurna in Nepal, in the Annapurna Conservation Area, looking at how tourism could enhance sustainable development. And one of the aspects of this area, which is a very, very poor area and contains different cultural groups, was that people were very surprised who lived there the Westerners would want to travel all this way to see their culture and their environment. So it's a realisation that what is around is actually can be seen as very, very special and has a universal value by the fact that people are willing to travel there and visit it. So... Although there are real benefits that are offered by tourism to um, related to cultural tourism, there are, of course, threats. And these relate to two main aspects. One is the exponential growth of tourism in recent decades. So in 1950, there were about 25 million international tourists. By 2019, the last pre-COVID year, when tourism was in full swing, then the figure was about 1.8 billion. So it's a massive increase. And that's just for international tourism. If you include domestic tourism, we can probably uh, multiply that by 10 times the, the figure. So it's a very, very rapid growth. And one of the aspects of that is the reliance of the mobility of all of these people, primarily on carbon-based fuels. And aviation is a big part of that, that movement. Um, it takes, I think, approximately about 75% share of the total international tourist movement. And um, this is a big threat, of course, to the sustainability of the environment into the future which impacts on cultural tourism in different ways. But um, it certainly will have large impacts into the future, both on the tangible and intangible aspects and, and living cultures of places. And um, this is a real challenge as to how we actually deal with that into the future. And I will, uh, towards the end of the talk, just talk about some strategies and ideas that are being put forward relating to that. So this mobility is, um, is a key problem. The second aspect that we probably all familiar with, the aspects of over-tourism in certain destinations where too many tourists are arriving in, in places like Venice, like Amsterdam, Palm Mallorca, um, Dubrovnik, Angkor Wat in uh, Cambodia, Kofi Phi Island in Thailand, which is the beach of which was actually closed because of the, the over-tourism problem. And um, this is a, a tremendous issue. Um, if you are resident of Venice and um, you experience a tremendous overcrowding of tourists that come to Venice because of its fantastic culture, you know, history, um, such an interesting place to visit. But unfortunately, um, it really suffers from aspects of over-tourism, and that impacts greatly on the lives of living residents in different ways, just from the physical sensation and unpleasantness of overcrowding, but also from increases in property prices and lack of property to rent because it's being used for Airbnb. So there's a tremendous disruption to everyday life that is being caused by the numbers of people coming in. And very often, that is partly to do with cruise ships as well, um, offloading thousands of people into these culturally significant destinations um, of which they are, are a part, the tour is a part. A 
other aspects that, that threaten um, tourism and relate and, and the culture. So if we look at intangible culture, um, then one of the dangers is that dances and rituals become performed for tourists. They are taken out of context and they are done to earn money. So they begin to lose their significance and meaning in the culture. And consequently, there is a loss of authenticity. It becomes a, a commercialized product, a product of consumption, rather than being done for its cultural significance. Partly similar to numbers, aspects of the impacts, negative impacts on artifacts and tangible heritage relates to the behavior of tourists. Um, Things like touching monuments, for example, being unaware about that, just the sheer numbers of people doing that, aspects of tourist behaviour, which may be antisocial in places and cause antagonism with local local residents. We think about a natural resource like coral as well, then tourists walking over that coral and destroying it unaware. So there are different there are different interactions that, that may be taking place that are causing negative impacts that could actually be solved. Um, They're not difficult things to solve. And again, I will come on to that in a couple of minutes. But the aspects of this interaction and experience with culture, which is very central to tourism, gazing upon performances and rituals, many of the issues and problems arise from the numbers of people who are doing this. And this is a very challenging issue for sustainable cultural tourism about how we deal with this because we've lived in a world or recent times where really market forces have been left to dictate virtually everything the outcomes of everything and the idea of intervention has been something that has been not encouraged shall we say by international lending agencies and the whole idea of the political spectrum, the political economy of how the world should develop. And trying to interfere with tourism and tourists is also extremely difficult, partly because of its legacy of something that's been seen as purely a fun activity, something that's enjoyable, something that's a reward for the work that's conducted Um, through the rest of the year and something that people should be free to enjoy. Um, So restricting that is required some kind of cultural shift um, to do that in the mindsets of what we expect from tourism. But really, if we want to have sustainability into the future, we have to start looking at some of those, those measures to do that and employing them actively. Moving on to the last part, so then policy management considerations about how we can actually gain the benefits of sustainable cultural tourism into the future and deal with these threats that I've talked about. Firstly, I think we need to really rethink about how we use um, aviation as a a form of, of mobility. The tremendous deliberalization of um, the the skies has presented low-cost travel for millions of people. It presents the opportunities, which is a a good thing. It allows people to to travel. But we need to really think about how that is actually used and ideas of casual flying, for example, just doing lots of trips every year because it's cheap. It's not expensive to do that. Taking lots of short breaks and... In a world where we are working towards net zero and aviation is the one area that is probably the most problematic to achieve that, partly because although there have been great technological advances in reducing emissions per aircraft, greenhouse gas emissions per aircraft, at the same time the exponential growth has outstripped those gains. So it means that as we go into the future, aviation is using an increasing amount of the remaining carbon budget to actually keep the rise in the average global temperature to two degrees centigrade or less. Its predictions are that it will increase 
if it increases exponentially as it has done, then it will be using 60% of the carbon budget. It's approximately that figure. It's a very, very significant amount. And unfortunately, there aren't the technological solutions to of alternative fuels available on the scale that is needed um, at present. And it, the predictions are they will not be in the medium future either. So we do have to reconsider behavioural changes about how we use aviation to actually experience cultural tourism. Another consideration is about how virtual technologies can be used to recreate the cultural tourism experience of visiting places. These are making very, very quick advances. Um, In 10 years' time, we don't know where we will be with these, how much experience of place can actually be brought into the home. We know that certainly during the COVID pandemic, that has changed a lot, and the use of information technology for work, for retailing, But for traveling, this is different because traveling has always been about experiencing the place. So somehow you have to be able to recreate that sensory experience of place in the home. And maybe at some stage we will be able to do that. We may be able to have a tour of the Vatican and have the the full experience of being there. And to what extent that will satisfy tourists and diminish the desire to actually travel to a place is uncertain. But it it nevertheless will be likely to have some impact, I would think, in the next decade. We need to look at planning and management measures, so carrying capacity limits, um, price and control measures to limit the numbers of people going into certain places. And this may be specific sites. It could even be destinations, um, parts of cities in the future, uh, limiting the numbers of tourists that can actually go in because local residents um, have had enough of over tourism and they want to be able to live their lives as they wish and not have it dictated to by uh, tourists. So, you know, these are controversial ideas in a way, but are something that we perhaps will see more of in the future. The other likelihood, if we don't, is that local residents will move out of those areas and they will just become essentially tourist ghettos with very few local residents. Um, the other aspect is relates to the, the, the planning, the hegemony, the political economy of tourism and the role of local communities taking the initiatives in planning and dictating what they want tourism to be used for um, in their communities and in the development of those communities and how much tourism they want rather than it having, rather than it being being pressed onto them and then having to experience it um, without any control over what happens to it. So, again, the planning control measures, the, the role of the community is very essential into the future for sustainable cultural tourism. And lastly, I think the awareness to campaigns to modify tourist behaviour, there's a great need for more education about impacts of tourism, starting with flying, about how you a flight, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas emissions is emitted, should flying advertisements carry health warnings, for example, similar to greenhouse gas uh, warnings, similar to health warnings um, that they have for cigarettes, you know, your flight to San Diego is equivalent to heating your house for a year or whatever in terms of GHG emissions, simple messages. And also uh, within destinations about how antisocial tourist behaviour impacts on local people and even a wider awareness about aspects of using Airbnbs, for example, how it impacts on rentals. So there's an ethical side to this as well. It's about consideration of local communities and other people when you are a tourist. A range of different measures then that I'm setting out for sustainable cultural tourism into the future and for perhaps discussion and members of the academy to possibly think about because sustainable cultural tourism is a very important issue for cultural policy and it offers great opportunities, um, but it offers threats. And 
we need to negate those threats to actually realize the opportunities they can bring, both for local communities, but also individuals as tourists and enhancing their understanding of the world and improving their cultural knowledge of it. So thank you for listening to me and I hope you get some use from this podcast. Bye-bye.